She is the Director of Community Development for the PCBSD Project and is the founder and current chair of the BSD Certification Group Incorporated. Uh, she is at the free BSD booth here at the Mini Expo. Please uh, feel free to visit after the talk. And uh, we're happy to have the BSD Certification Group here at Flourish 2011. They're offering certification exams tomorrow, Sunday. So please welcome Drew Levine. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? That doesn't seem to be too bad. So I'm here today to talk about PCBSD, uh, which is supposed to be an easy to use BSD desktop, and hopefully that's not an oxymoron. Um, as um, Nelson mentioned, I'm currently the community manager for the PCBSD project. So as part of the talk, I'll also talk a little bit about the community and how if you're interested, you can become involved. Now, let's see how we're switching here that way. Okay, so the things that we're gonna discuss. Um, if you've heard of PCBSD before, you may wonder, is it still FreeBSD? Uh, if not, how it differs? So we'll start with that. Um, if you haven't used a BSD before and you're more used to a Linux distro, um, we'll cover some of the things that will be different if you try a, a BSD desktop. I'll give a overview of some of the features you can expect to see in the current version. And we are currently testing and preparing for the next uh, version, which will be available in the summer. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the new stuff that will be going into the new version. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the PBI system, uh, which is unique to PCBSD. It's another way to manage software. And that is actually being changed for the new version. And then we'll end uh, with ways that you can become involved. So we're going to start with how does PCBSD differ from FreeBSD? I'm sort of a visual person, so I always think that a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you've ever installed FreeBSD before, uh, when you do a FreeBSD install, uh, you can elect to install the X Windows environment. You can install um, your a desktop manager. But the first time you boot into it, that's what it's going to look like. So the assumption on a FreeBSD system is that you have the time, inclination, and knowledge to build the system from scratch to whatever it is that you'd like it to look like. PCBSD, the first time you boot into it, will look like that. So you're going to already have a pre-configured environment that is ready for you to use. It's still FreeBSD under the hood, so you can still learn about it, but you don't have to have a lot of knowledge just to get started using it. So that's a big difference right there. If we start looking at features, um, besides the visual, what are some of the differences? FreeBSD has had an installer called Sysinstall. It's been around since the beginning of the project in the early 90s. And when it was originally created, it was meant to be a temporary hack. Well, it's 2011, and that's still the installer for FreeBSD. And if anyone's ever used it before, it's easy to use, but it's end curses. You're using your arrow keys. So it's not a really modern installer. So PC Sysinstall, which is used by PCBSD, is a modern graphical installer. So it looks real pretty. You can use your mouse. Um, looks like a, you know, a, a modern installation utility. But besides the look, it allows you to do things that you currently can't do using Sysinstall. So Sysinstall has been around for so long, a lot of the new features that went into FreeBSD, for one reason or another, didn't make it into Sysinstall. So for example, if I use the FreeBSD installer to install FreeBSD, I can only use UFS as a file system. So ZFS has been in FreeBSD fairly stable for about the last five years. With the PC sysinstaller, I can choose to install ZFS right at install time. I can uh, choose to set up ZRAID. If I want to do uh, mirroring, whether on UFS or ZFS, I can do so. Yes? Uh, is that a current 
Or for CFS or is that a user space? No, definitely it's built into the kernel okay. and it's uh, very stable on FreeBSD. Uh, the other thing is um, GPT partitions currently aren't supported using FreeBSD sysinstall, but that's something that you can choose to do using PC sysinstall. When you're setting up your partitions, you can choose which ones you would like to encrypt, and you can set up that during the install as well. And the other thing that you get is you do get a live mode. So if you want to check your hardware first uh, before you commit to an install, that's something you can do with PC sysinstall. PC sysinstall was created for PCBSD. About two years ago, it was ported to FreeBSD, so you can go to the FreeBSD ports collection and install it if you want to play with it. Beyond the installer, if we start looking at the configurations, um, the desktop is already set up for you. Uh, your video should already be working. Sound. Anybody ever tried to get Java or Flash working on a FreeBSD system? It's usually an afternoon's worth of exercise, and it seems to be every version it changes, and you have to do something a little different. It just works out of the box on PCBSD. So we're looking at a desktop system. So the stuff that you're not going to have on your server, but it's really nice to have on a desktop. The other thing um, that the PCBSD project had to do was to create um, graphical management utilities because they didn't exist for BSD. So anything that didn't come with your desktop manager, so say with KDE or GNOME, we had to create something for BSD. Having said all that, PCBSD still is FreeBSD. So we, when we do a release, we do it a couple of days after FreeBSD, and we're running that version of FreeBSD. That's an advantage because it means anything you can do in FreeBSD, you can obviously still do in PCBSD. So if you've been a FreeBSD user for a while, you can still continue to do uh, whatever it is you like to do with FreeBSD. And a very distinct advantage is FreeBSD has tons of documentation. They have a very good um, handbook, which basically tells you how to do anything on FreeBSD. That still all applies. All of the FreeBSD FAQs, all the information you can find on FreeBSD forums, it still works on PCBSD. And one advantage is a lot of the stuff in the handbook that tells you how to set something up, you don't have to do because it's already been done for you. But if you're curious and want to know how is it working under the hood, that documentation is still there so you can learn uh, what it is uh, that makes it work. When PCBSD uh, was originally created, the project's been around for about five years. Uh, they decided to support um, one desktop manager well to make it easy for users and to provide support. The decision was made to use KDE um, because one, it's pretty, uh, provides you with a lot of utilities, and it's customizable. Users can play with wallpaper, all that cool stuff. Since then, we've discovered that the world is full of people who can't stand KDE. And one of the things that we're going to be changing for the next version is we're going to decouple everything from KDE and allow you to select what window manager you'd like to install during the installation. So that's why we're doing a lot of testing in 9. Um, for those um, who are trying to run KDE on older hardware, it's painful because KDE is a hog on resources. The current version of PCBSD does allow you to boot into Fluxbox. Um, so if you want to do that, and both of them um, tie into the PCBSD tools. Uh, software is available, making it easy to install GNOME, XFCE, and Enlightenment. And for uh, the other window managers, uh, FreeBSD ports, I checked yesterday, there's 187 window managers that you can install. When we get into the graphical app uh, utilities, um, there are utilities that allow you to do common things, so networking, user management, printer management, 
uh, stuff that you'd expect to see in an operating system. Uh, these had to be created from scratch because BSD device names are different than Linux device names and a lot of the paths where things are expected to be found will be different on a BSD system. And we also have some graphical utilities for features that are unique to FreeBSD. So for example, FreeBSD provides something called jails and we provide a graphical environment to manage jails. There are a couple of customizations in the kernel um, that are designed more for a desktop environment as opposed to a server environment. On a BSD system, if you want to load kernel modules, there's a file called loader.conf. If you want to load um, various um, variables, uh, there's a file called sysctl.com for your sysctl values. And if you want to decide which services start at boot up, you put it in a file called rc.conf. So these are the main configuration files on a BSD system. There are some additional values uh, that are added to the stock free BSD defaults. And if you're curious, all of the customizations are kept in our track database. So you can go to that location, look up those files, and see what the changes are from a traditional FreeBSD system. The, else, uh, the other thing that you can see, if you go to that directory, uh, anything that says overlay, these are additional files that are added to a default FreeBSD installation. So it's very easy to see what changes were made to the operating system. And for those that are interested in URLs, my very last slide um, has a link um, to the uh, presentation itself, because I do have a lot of URLs in upcoming slides. So that's sort of the, the deal between PCBSD and FreeBSD. If you're coming from a Linux environment, some of the changes that you can expect to see in a BSD environment, one of the first things you're going to notice, especially if you do an install, is the file systems are completely different. You're not going to find riser, you're not going to find ext, because BSD uses different file systems. Traditional file system on a BSD system is a Unix file system, or UFS. PC installer allows you to pick the traditional UFS, or you can add journaling, that's plus J, or you can add something called soft updates, plus S, which is a different way of dealing with the FSCK problem. And also you can choose ZFS as well. On a BSD system, device names are different. So for example, if I'm referring to an Ethernet device on a Linux system, it'll always be ETH followed by the number of the device. On a BSD system, the name of the device depends upon the chipset. So if the device uses an Atheros chipset, it'll start with ATH. If it uses a Realtek chipset, it'll be RE. Now that seems complicated to begin with, but the advantage is, is each of those has a man page. So I can, for example, read man ATH, and it will tell me all the hardware models that are supported by that chipset. So I can look and see if my particular hardware is supported. There is a bunch of them. So there are some, and it depends upon whether it's ethernet or wireless. So we have IWI. Yeah. So what I usually do is I do a man hyphen K and the name of Intel or whatever, and that'll show me all the man pages, and then I can grep for the model. Uh, some commands are going to be different. So for example, on a, a Linux system, if I want to load a kernel module, I use INS mod. On a BSD system, I use KLD load. So you will notice that some commands have different names. Uh, one of the things that a lot of users miss when they're on a BSD system is there is a difference between BSD style switches and GNU style switches. So a BSD style switch will always be one hyphen followed by a letter and GNU style is two hyphens followed by a word. And by default on a BSD system you just get BSD style. And if you miss that, you run the command package add core utils, and it gives you the GNU style switches for the common Unix commands. Yes? Uh, yeah, uh, 
uh, a question about the file systems. Uh, yes. Those are the default file systems you support. Do you have support for EXT file systems if you want to read uh, Linux uh, drives? Yes. For now, depending upon the version of EXT, um, it may be read only or it may be read write. And that would be read only. Yeah. So what we usually suggest is that you use something like Samba and have a, an NTFS partition if you want shared data. It will work for all of your systems. My workstation and I have a, uh, a logical volume group that is my, my home space, yeah. uh, which is a uh, you know, running EXT4 uh, volume group. Yeah. One of the plans, um, so we have various sources of funding to, to get new functionality in, and FreeBSD Foundation is one of them, and one of our plans for the future is to get full read-write support for EXT4. But as of today, no, it's going to be read-only. Okay. Um, the other thing, if you're a system administrator, um, one thing that's different on a BSD system is we don't use run levels. Uh, we can still accomplish the same thing, we just don't do it using run levels. So there's a different way to achieve that. If you're on a BSD system, from an end user point of view, there's usually not that much difference. So usually most of the applications that you're used to using will also work on a BSD system. If it's open source, it's probably already been ported uh, to FreeBSD. Um, I checked this morning, and right now there's over 22,000 applications that are ported and that work on FreeBSD. If there is a particular application that hasn't been ported yet, you can still run it under something called Linux binary emulation, which will allow you to run the binary without modifying it. Uh, both support Xorg, um, so that typically means if you already have an Xorg.com file that you're happy with, it'll still work on the same hardware in a BSD system. I'll preface that with um, depending upon your driver. So for example, if it is an ATI or a Radeon, you may not be able to get your 3D, because currently we're still working on GEM and KMS support, and that's something that's supposed to be finished by end of July or sorry, end of June, early July. Okay, let's take a look at some of the current features. So if you install PCBSD. Uh, one of the big things, because it's something that we wrote from scratch, is something called the PBI system, or a push button installer. So traditionally on a free BSD system, you had two choices for installing software. You could either use package add to install a pre-compiled binary, or you could use something called the ports collection to compile your own binary. The PBI system um, is designed to make it easy for desktop users, especially users that are novice to Unix, to still be able to manage your software. So it's a fully graphical environment. Um, the current version um, separates the libraries, so it's impossible for you to muck up your system if you start installing and uninstalling a lot of software. Uh, we recommend that if you're brand new to open source operating systems, that you start with the PBI system. Because um, it doesn't matter how novice you are, you can safely deal with your software. It does have a software browser, so you can find out what applications are available. Basically, you double click on something and it installs it for you. I have a couple of screenshots of the current system. So there's a software browser. It does have a search if you have a particular application that you'd like to install. And it's also divided into categories if you just want to see what's available. Once you find something, it'll have a description for it. Um, and basically, you just click on the download link, and it takes care of it for you. PCBSD uh, works on both 32-bit and 64-bit hardware. Uh, the PBI system will ch uh, check what architecture you're running, and it's also aware of the version that you're running, and it will install the correct software for you. Once you install software, it'll list all the software you have installed and what versions they are, and it will automatically notify you when new versions are available. So 
if we take a look at the, the guts of the PBI system, what it's doing in the background, it will take an existing FreeBSD package and basically wrap it into an installer program. When the underlying FreeBSD package changes, our build server is aware of that and it will go and automatically build the new PBI and then it will notify you through Software Manager that a newer version is available. The other thing that's included in Software Manager is a security advisory system. So when FreeBSD issues a security advisory, we go and make a patch for PCBSD systems and then a Software Manager will notify you that there is an advisory. You may want to patch your system. Uh, if we take a look at the installed software tab, it shows all of the PBIs that have been installed on this system and currently uh, Pigeon and Warden have newer versions available. If the user wanted to update, they would simply highlight the ones they want to upgrade and click the update button and it will tell you when it's finished. This is the system updates tab. This one is showing uh, two um, advisories. So one is actually a security advisory um, that deals with KDE. And the other thing that you'll find in this tab is uh, NVIDIA makes um, drivers specific for PCBSD. And whenever a newer version of the NVIDIA driver comes along, uh, we will roll that in as well. So it's easy to keep that updated. Um, if it is a security advisory, if you highlight it and click the View Details button, it will um, bring you to the advisory so you can read it and decide if this is a patch that you would like to install on your system. There is also, if you right-click um, an entry, uh, you can choose to ignore it. So, for example, if you're not using NVIDIA hardware and you don't care there's a newer version available, you can just hide that so you don't have to look at it. So that's the current system. If we take a look at some of the other utilities, um, we do have something called Ports Jail. So we get a lot of users that are new to the FreeBSD way of dealing with ports and packages. And what we've done is we've created a jail environment. So it's almost like a CH root or a sandbox. It's separate from the rest of the operating system. So that means you can go in and play with ports, compile them, um, install, uninstall, and it's not going to affect your operating system. If you have no idea what a jail is, uh, I do have the link there to the Wikipedia reference. It sort of gives you a basic description as well as links to the original papers on jails if you're looking for more technical specifications. Speaking of jails, we do have a graphical uh, utility called Warden, and this allows you to easily make jails uh, manage them so you can start and stop them, install software in jails, and you can delete them. A couple of things um, that you don't get on a FreeBSD system, there currently aren't any ports um, that uh, have this functionality, is one, you can clone a jail. So for example, if I have, um, one of the reasons I may want to make a jail is I want to set up a LAMP environment. And I can go in and install that, do all my configurations, put in whatever data I want. Then I can clone that and either install it in another jail in the same system or on a totally different system. So that gives me that pre-configured environment. The other concept we have is something called inmates. So an inmate may be a bundle of uh, specific applications that you want to be able to easily put on a multiple amount of jails. So you create a file, ends with a WIT extension, and it allows you to install it into whatever jails you wish. Warden has also been ported to FreeBSD, so you can go to the FreeBSD ports collection and download Warden. Uh, we have a firewall manager. So on a BSD system, we don't use IP tables. We use something called PF. And there is not a GUI out there now for PF, except for uh, the one that we provide on a PCBSD system. If you've never heard of PF before, I like to think of it as the world's greatest firewall, because there's a lot of cool things you can do with it. Um, but it's the OpenBSD people that do the creation of it. And uh, the best 
information site to get information is at that URL. One of the things we're configure, uh, considering for nine is rather than maintaining our own graphical environment is to um, instead switch to FW Builder, which is an open source project. It's a really nice um, firewall uh, graphical environment which supports IP tables, PF, IPFW, Cisco IOS. And if you're in a commercial environment, it looks a lot like Checkpoint. So if you're used to how Checkpoint does things, you'll be very familiar with the interface. The only reason we don't have it in now is they don't have um, full um, PF support to be able to uh, import and export your um, PF um, configuration, and that's something that they're working on right now. So as soon as that is finished, we'll be using FW Builder in our system. Right now, the module is uh, fairly straightforward, so you can start, stop, restart your firewall. If you really muck it up, you can go back to a default configuration that works. And you can go in and view your current rules and add rules, uh, either by port number or by um, name. This um, graphical utility does not do all the funky stuff you can do with PF. So if you're used to doing really cool stuff, you can still go down and modify your pf.conf file manually. So this is more designed for the end user that just needs to manage a simple firewall. Uh, we do have a network manager. This one had to be written from scratch um, because there currently wasn't a GUI out there for BSD systems. Uh, again, all of the device names on a BSD system are different than Linux. Uh, currently, we support Ethernet, wireless, PPP, and PPPoE. It auto detects any of the interfaces that have supported drivers. If you're doing wireless, uh, you can make multiple profiles for the networks you want to connect to. And it will show you the stats in the addressing info for the interfaces that are currently configured. So again, fairly simple GUI. Uh, this one is showing an Ethernet and a wireless interface, and it's looking at the properties of the Ethernet interface. And this one, we've highlighted the wireless, and we're um, setting up a wireless profile. We have a system manager that has a couple of things that are unique on a BSD system. The one that is handiest is you can view your system info, and I'll just show a screenshot of that. This uh, button here, the generate, if you're having problems on your BSD system and you want to send info to a mailing list, uh, just click that button and it'll make a text file. It'll have all your message, your IF config, your var log messages, all the diagnostic stuff that um, makes it easy for someone on a mailing list to figure out what your problem is. It'll put your xorg.conf in there, a bunch of stuff. Uh, printer manager, um, we do use the CUPS system. Um, CUPS does provide you with a um, setup thing that you can do through your browser, which is really ugly and works when it feels like working. Um, KDE also provides a printer uh, GUI, which works when it feels like working. Um, so we in 8 did pretty good work on auto detection, and it works about 99% of the time. And for 9, um, we've add, done a lot of bug fixes um, for the uh, utility we're using for that. So we're hoping that one will be flawless. Um, currently, most of the time, it will auto detect your model and pick out the driver that is best to use. And again, it provides your print job management, that sort of stuff. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like, so this one currently already has a printer set up. You can go in, you know, print your test job. So basic stuff you'd expect to see in a printer manager. Question. Yep. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's pretty good. It's a bummer when it doesn't auto detect, but, but we're, we're at about 99% of the time. It's pretty good. 
Uh, we do have a user manager, make it very easy to um, add, delete users, throw them into groups, um, set things like their home directory in their shell. Well, I guess I took, I used to have a picture of that. I guess I took it out. I was getting too many slides. Uh, this one is unique uh, to PCBSD. We call it Life Preserver. This allows you to take a full system backup, which is integrated into the installer. So if you ever really muck up your system, if you stick your install disk in, you can go and opt to restore the system from an existing backup. You can also use it as a backup management utility, so it doesn't have to take a full system backup. You should have at least one full, and then you can decide how often you want to do your backups and what you'd like to back up. This one um, is designed to back up to another system, and it uses rsync and SSH to do that. So the other system has to be running both of those. If the other system is PCBSD, they're already set up and ready to go. Um, it allows you to automate backups and do a restore. Uh, so this one, just looking at properties, you can decide how many backups you want to keep um, when you want to do the backups. And if you decide to do partial backups, you can create an exclude list. So it'll only back up uh, what it is you'd like it to do. One of the reasons um, when we created the PBIs, we wanted a really easy system for new users to be able to install software. And right now, there's probably about 500 PBIs of the most used open source projects. So you're going to have like OpenOffice, Firefox, GIMP, stuff like that. In the FreeBSD ports collection, there's over 22,000 applications. So we've done two things. One is we've created a environment where you can very easily convert an existing FreeBSD port into a PBI, because we don't know what it is that users are going to want to use. Maybe there'll be a lot of users that want to use some funky thing that nobody ever heard of before. So they can go and create that PBI and put it in our repository. Um, and it also means that a lot of the ports that nobody uses anymore aren't stuck in the PBI collection. So you're not wading through a bunch of crap. So we've created an environment where creating a PBI can be as simple as changing two variables in a text file. And the first variable is the name of the program, and the second variable is where in the KDE menu do you want me to put it. So it can be as simple as that to make a PBI. There are literally, there's probably about 50 variables that you can play with if you want to do funky stuff with your PBI. So if the user needs to accept an end user license agreement, for example, you can make sure that they're uh, prompted for that during the install. And what it does is it creates a clean build sandbox for each PBI. So before we had this system, you had to basically do a fresh install to have a pristine environment, create the PBI, blow away that system if you wanted to create another PBI. Here you can create as many PBIs as you want, and they all live in their own sandbox. And PC sysinstall. So um, there is the graphical installer that the user sees, but running that is a bunch of born shell scripts. So it's a very easy environment if you want to add those scripts um, um, to your own environment. And some of the cool things that advanced users can do is they can create automated installations with those scripts. You can go in and customize. Um, so if you need certain applications to be installed during the install, if you need to set up your host names, that sort of stuff. And on a PCBSD system, there are tons of examples uh, that come in that directory. And it's also been ported to FreeBSD, so if you want to play with it there. And the documentation is starting to get pretty good for it, and uh, there's the URL for that. Okay, so that was eight, our current version, some of our plans for nine. A lot of the stuff that we did in the graphical environment was designed to augment KDE, to give it the BSD stuff that didn't come with KDE. So we had to go and decouple all of that from KDE. 
because in nine you're going to be able to choose what desktop environment you want. So we've gone and all of those have been ported and they're separate from the desktop. Uh, right now we can integrate those tools into any XDG compliant desktop manager. So the big desktop managers have it and most of the very popular ones are something called XDG compliant. That means that um, you'll still see, get the icons, things will still be added to your menus, and you'll still have access to all of those tools. We've created a control panel that will go into all of those desktop environments where you can easily find all of those uh, management utilities. And I have a screenshot from one of our snapshot uh, builds of the control panel. And right now, those are the utilities that are in there. Uh, they're working on a separate Wi-Fi utility, so that will show up soon. And um, I think there's some other stuff that's going to go in as well uh, before 9 is released. But very simple place to find your management utilities. We also went and overhauled the PBI structure. So it's one thing to be able to have this really nice graphical environment, but a lot of administrators were saying, I would love to have command line tools that I can work with. So it was all written to give us command line tools. And the design of the command line tools were to make it familiar for anybody used to FreeBSD's tools. So for example, on a FreeBSD system, I have PKG underscore add. Now you'll have PBI underscore add. I have a PBI underscore info, PBI underscore delete. So names that would be very familiar to uh, FreeBSD admins. One of the other things we did for eight, and we're going to continue um, going forward, is to release our documentation with the operating system. So there was an 8.2 version of the handbook, comes right on the desktop, and we're currently working on the 9.0 version that will come on the desktop. And we also release that in many formats, and um, you can also, if you like to um, donate, you can purchase, say, on Kindle, and we're working to get it for Barnes & Noble's Nook. And because it's FreeBSD, any of the cool stuff that's coming in FreeBSD 9 will also be in PCBSD 9. And there is a lot of cool stuff in the pipes, and um, Ivan always has a good list of what's being worked on for the next version. We concentrate a moment on the PBI format. So we, we have the um, command line tools with names very familiar uh, to FreeBSD users. One of the biggest complaints uh, we've received from users dealing with updates is because it contained all of the libraries um, and it wasn't incremental, you basically had to download a really big file all over again every time you wanted to update. So the the design was changed that you only download the stuff that changed. So for example, if you used to update Firefox, it used to be like an 80 meg download, and now it's about 1.2 megs, and you can update to the next version. We've added digital signature, uh, signature verification, which we didn't have before, and instead of re-downloading libraries every time, we now have a database that intelligently manages library sharing. So if you're deleting something, it's not going to delete a library that is going to be required by another program. And we, we've rebranded it. It's now going to be called App Cafe. And to give you a uh, screenshot of it, this is the current version. The look will probably change before 9 is released. Uh, some of the new features you get is as new PBIs are added to the repository, um, it'll show what the latest releases are, so of new software. Again, it still has a search and it still has categories. Um, the installed is a little bit different, so you can go in and look at a, um, a particular PBI and it'll tell you if it's already installed or not. There's also a checkbox if you just want it to automatically update when a new version is available, rather than prompt you to do it yourself. A couple of things you can do if you uh, right-click a piece of software is you can decide to install desktop icons, menu icons, uh, either for yourself or all users. 
And one of the things that's really cool for admins is a lot of them wanted to create their own PBIs and have their own internal repositories. So we have a whole suite of repo commands that allow you to management. So you can go in and create your own repository. You can decide to use that as a default or you can choose to pick another repository for a particular install. Um, the format is different, so we do have a conversion utility, so all the existing eight PBIs can go into nine format. And one of the things that just got added this month is the ability for regular users to install applications. That means you don't have to give out the SU password. Uh, they can, it ties into uh, sudo, so they will be prompted for their own password, and then they can go and install their own files. A couple of the PBIs will be marked as only the super user or the administrative account can install them. So for example, your users won't be installing web servers and setting those up. And we're starting on the documentation for the new format and that's going to go into the nine handbook. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left, how you can help. PCBSD is designed for users to use because every user needs a desktop and we would love to see everybody using PCBSD as their desktop. So we do take user feedback seriously and a lot of the stuff that's going into nine, which was a lot of work to put in, was the result of users telling us this is what we really need on our system. And we have lots of opportunities for involvement. So if you um, speak or write another language, uh, we have very active translations and localization groups. Uh, PCBSD is localized into about 60 languages. So that means your menus will show in your language of choice. Uh, anybody who's ever done localization work before, um, we use a graphical system called Poodle, which means the translators the only equipment they need is a web browser and they don't have to learn how to deal with localization strings. Instead, the original text shows in one frame, you type what you want it to say and it does everything in the background for you. So that means that your translators don't have to learn to use a tool, they can just go in and translate text. We're currently working on a similar um, system for uh, translating our documentation because uh, we're very interested in getting the documentation translated. We've been very successful in asking users to let us know what PBIs they'd like to create. So one we encourage, it's fairly easy to make a PBI, feel free to go ahead and do it. But if you don't have the time or the confidence to do so, let us know what PBIs would be useful to you. So we have a forum where people can go in and request a PBI and usually within a week somebody has made one, it's been tested and it's uploaded to the repository. So we've had very good success with that. Uh, we tend to be a very friendly um, community, so um, it, you're, you don't have to be scared to join us on the IRC channel and you don't have to put on your flame suit. Um, the forums are friendly as well. Um, we're taking documentation very seriously and so we're always looking for people to contribute documentation and again if you don't think that you're a good writer we ask that you read our documentation and let us know if there's grammos, typos, things that need to be clearer because the more people who put their eyes on documentation the better documentation is. And we're having about a seven month test cycle for PCBSD9. There's a lot of changes going into it. We're probably going to discover every desktop bug known to man now that we start supporting a lot of desktops. So we encourage people, if you have a favorite desktop, go in and try it on the, our testing snapshots and let us know what is broken and what needs to be fixed. And uh, again, all of this stuff is documented uh, on our wiki, so ways you can support PCBSD and we always have a list of tasks that are looking for people. Additional resources, so obviously our website, uh, the handbook, uh, all of our documentation. Uh, FAQs are definitely a work in progress because we're trying to basically get everything into the handbook. Uh, there is a blog, so if you're interested 
um, knowing what's happening on a, a fairly daily basis. And this is where we also put out all our calls for testers as we get new functionality. Uh, we are on IRC Freenode. We have forums. We have a bunch of mailing lists. Uh, if you're into social media, we have a Facebook and LinkedIn group. And there is uh, one book out there on PCBSD, which means for a while I can say that I wrote the book. And I recommend it. It's a good book. Uh, if you need to contact me, there's my um, email address, and there's the link to the, to the slides. And I'll leave that up during the question period. Uh, any questions? Yes? So when 9 comes out, is it uh, you have to delete 8 and reinstall 9? Like yeah, so our installer does give you an upgrade utility, and we always recommend that you back up before you try to do a, uh, an upgrade. Um, usually upgrades are flawless in the same um, version, so any version of 8 you should be able to upgrade to another version of 8. Things always get hairier when you go from, say, an 8 to a 9. And when you're dealing with the dot zero release, you should really make sure you back up the dot zero release. But we encourage if you backed up, you want to give it a go to see if it worked. And it also depends what you want to do yourself, because sometimes people were afraid to start with ZFS, maybe right now they're UFS, and they want to decide, well, here's a good chance to try a different file system. So if you want to try something new, do a full install. Yes? Uh, I, I know with a lot of Linux distributions, they usually like fill a niche. For example, uh, Backtrack that we've had testing, Ubuntu is usually a very good transition state for new Linux users. Uh, is there a specific niche that uh, PCPSD wants to fulfill? Desktop. So right now, the only desktop that's been available for BSD users, besides the ones that want to build their own, has been Mac OS. It's done a really good job at spreading um, free BSD, though people don't know that's what they're using. Um, but we, we basically want BSD users to have their own desktop as an open source version. And by desktop, you mean like a Google interface? Yes. Yeah. And again, design for a server. So the BSD um, mentality has always been a server is as lean an environment as you can make it. So you start out bare minimum and you just add what you want. That's always been sort of the BSD way of doing things. And the desktop is a very different view, which is usually throw in the entire kitchen sink and see what you got to play with. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. PSD is a uh, Mac platform based, based on uh, Mac OS, not the base of Mac. Are there any commonality or how do you, should, uh, are you the sharing uh, uh, distros? Uh, not distros, say, I mean, the, the, your, your uh, EDI stuff. Any cross in those kind of Yeah, I, I, don't know, I don't know if they're aware of it, um, what we have. So before Mac OS X uh, came out, uh, it was based on something called Darwin. And Darwin was basically a port of FreeBSD. And there was something, there was a something called Darwin Ports, which was basically using FreeBSD ports on a Mac hardware. So when they came up with OS X, it, it came out of that family. So there's a lot of FreeBSD in there. Obviously, the hardware was different at that time. It was still on the Mac. Anybody else? Yes. In the uh, handbook, is there uh, any type of uh, reference to system requirements? Yes, definitely. Yeah. With KDE, definitely. Yes. Yeah. I just had it crash the live. I was trying to load the live version, and the KDE kept crashing on it. Now, what you may want to try is in the 9 version, we have a CD version. Because uh, again, we're, we're going to be um, using more lightweight desktop managers. And the CD version uses LXDE, which, which is nice and lightweight. Okay, so the latest one, 461, came out after 8.2 was released. 
I, I actually upgraded to it because I'm a crusty old FreeBSD user. In my mind, KDE 4 was a major step backwards from 3.5.4, which is what I was running on CentOS 5 back. So the, the current version on 8.2 is the version before 4.6.1. Our testing snapshots will be the latest version of KDE if you choose to install KDE. I understand. Yes. Okay. Yes. Probably the best thing would be to install GNOME to start with, and then or, or XFCE, and uh, and then if you want to run KDE, install the latest. System, did you want to share it? Uh, I'm just asking, uh, you had a slide on the file system, yes. and I didn't see any that's, uh, at least I don't know which one would be supported by Linux. So if you do not put uh, what file system would you use to share files between the two systems? Yeah. If, if I wanted full read-write compatibility, I, I would use NTFS. NTFS, yeah. right? And that way you would be able to share between Windows systems, Linux systems, and ESD. Okay, so like EXT uh, isn't support. It'll show up, but you won't be able to write to it. Okay, so it's really low. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone.